Immanuel Kant, in answer to the question, what is enlightenment? Konigsberg, Prussia, 30th of September, 1784. Enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-incurred immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to use one's own understanding without the guidance of another. This immaturity is self-incurred if its cause is not lack of understanding, but lack of resolution and courage to use it without the guidance of another. The model of enlightenment is therefore separa ade, have courage to use your own understanding. Laziness and cowardice are the reasons why such a large portion of men, even when nature has long emancipated them from alien guidance, nevertheless gladly remain immature for life. For the same reasons, it is all too easy for others to set themselves up as their guardians. It is so convenient to be immature. If I have a book to have understanding in place of me, a spiritual advisor to have a conscience for me, a doctor to judge my diet for me, and so on, I need not make any effort at all. I need not think, as long as I can pay. Others will soon enough take the tiresome job over for me. The guardians who have kindly taken upon themselves the work of supervision will soon see to it that by far the largest part of mankind, including the entire fair sex, should consider the step forward to maturity not only as difficult, but also as highly dangerous. Have you first infatuated their domesticated animals, and carefully prevented the docile creatures from daring to take a single step without the leading strings to which they are tied. They next show them the danger which threatens them if they try to walk unaided. Now this danger is not in fact so very great, for they would certainly learn to walk after a few falls, but an example of this kind is intimidating, and usually frightens them off from further attempts. Thus it is difficult for each separate individual to work his way out of the immaturity which has become almost second nature to him. He has even grown fond of it, and is really incapable for the time being of using his own understanding, because he was never allowed to make the attempt. Dogmas and formulas, those mechanical instruments for rational use, or rather misuse, of his natural endowments, are the ball and chain of his permanent immaturity. If anyone did throw them off, he would still be uncertain about jumping over even the narrowest of trenches, for he would be unaccustomed to free movement of this kind. Thus only a few, by cultivating their own minds, have succeeded in freeing themselves from immaturity and in continuing boldly on their way. There is more chance of an entire public enlightening itself. This is indeed almost inevitable, if only the public concern is left in freedom. For there will always be a few who think for themselves, even amongst those appointed as guardians of the common mass. Such guardians, once they have they themselves thrown off the yoke of immaturity, will disseminate the spirit of rational respect for personal value and for the duty of all men to think for themselves. The remarkable thing about this is that if the public, which was previously put under the yoke by the guardians, is suitably stirred up by some of the latter, who are incapable of enlightenment, it may subsequently compel the guardians themselves to remain under the yoke. For it is very harmful to propagate prejudices, because they finally avenge themselves on the very people who first encouraged them, or whose predecessors did so. Thus the public can only achieve enlightenment slowly. A revolution may well put an end to autocratic despotism and to rapacious or power-seeking oppression, but it will never produce a true reform in any ways of thinking. Instead, new prejudices, like the ones they replace, will serve as a leash to control the great unthinking mass. For enlightenment of this kind, all that is needed is freedom, and the freedom in question is the most innocuous form of all freedom to make public use of one's reason in all matters. But I hear on all sides the cry, don't argue. The officer says, don't argue, get on parade. The tax official, don't argue, pay. The clergyman, don't argue, believe. All this means restrictions on freedom everywhere. But which sort of restrictions prevent enlightenment, and which, instead of hindering it, can actually promote it? I reply, the public use of man's reason must always be free and it alone can bring about enlightenment amongst men. The private use of reason might quite often be narrowly restricted, however, without undue hindrance to the progress of enlightenment. But by the public use of one's own reason, I mean that use which anyone may make of it as a man of learning addressing the entire reading public. What I term the private use of reason is that which a person may make of it in a particular civil post or office which he is entrusted. Now, in some affairs, which affect the interests of the commonwealth, we require a certain mechanism whereby some members of the commonwealth may behave purely passively, so that they may, 
by an artificial common agreement be employed by the government for public ends, or at least deterred from vindicating them. It is, of course, impermissible to argue in such cases obedience is imperative. But in so far as this or that individual who acts as part of the machine also considers himself as a member of a complete commonwealth or even of cosmopolitan society, and thence of a man of learning who may, through his writings, address a public in the true sense of the word. He may indeed argue without harming the affairs in which he is employed for some of the time in a passive capacity. Thus it would be very harmful if an officer receiving an order from his superiors were to quibble openly, while on duty, about the appropriateness or usefulness of the order in question. He must simply obey. But he cannot reasonably be banned from making observations as a man of learning on the errors in the military service, and from submitting these to his public for, for judgment. The citizen cannot refuse to pay the taxes imposed upon him. Presumptuous criticisms of such taxes, where someone is called upon to pay them, may be punished as an outrage which should lead to general insubordination. Nonetheless, the same citizen does not contravene his civil obligations if, as a learned individual, he publicly voices his thoughts on the impropriety or even injustice of such fiscal measures. In the same way, a clergyman is bound to instruct his pupils and his congregation in accordance with the doctrines of the church he serves, for he was employed by it on that condition. But as a scholar, he is completely free, as well as obliged, to impart to the public all his carefully considered, well-intentioned thoughts on the mistaken aspects of those doctrines and to often suggest for a better arrangement of religious and eschatorial affairs. And there is nothing in this which needs to trouble the conscience. I, or what he teaches in pursuit of his duties as an active servant of the church, is presented by him as something which he is not empowered to teach at his own discretion, but which he is employed to expound in a prescribed manner and in someone else's name. He will say, our church teaches this or that, and these are the arguments it uses. He then extracts as much practical value as possible for his congregation from the precepts to which he would not himself subscribe with full conviction, but which he can nevertheless undertake to expound, since it is not in fact wholly impossible that they may contain truth. At all events, nothing opposed to the essence of religion is presented in such doctrine, for if the clergyman thought he could find anything of this sort in them, he would not be able to carry out his official duties in good conscience, and would have to resign. Thus the use which someone employed as a teacher makes of his reason in the presence of his congregation is purely private, since a congregation, however large it is, is never any more than a domestic gathering. In view of this, he is not and cannot be free as a priest, since he is acting on commission imposed from outside. Conversely, as a scholar addressing the real public, i.e. the world at large, through his writings, the clergyman, making public use of his reason, enjoys unlimited freedom to use his own reason and to speak on his own person. For to maintain that the guardians of the people in spiritual matters should they themselves be immature is an absurdity which amounts to making absurdities permanent. But should not a society of clergymen, for example an Iscaterial Synod or a Venerable Presbytery, as the Dutch called, be entitled to commit itself by oath to a certain unalterable set of doctrines in order to, in order to secure for all time a constant guardianship over each of its members, and through them over its people? I reply this is quite impossible. A contract of this kind, concluded with a view to preventing all future enlightenment of mankind forever, is absolutely null and void, even if it is ratified by the supreme power, by imperial diets and the most solemn peace treaties. One age cannot enter into an alliance on oath to put the next age in a position where it would be impossible for it to extend and correct its knowledge, particularly on such important matters, or to make any progress whatsoever in enlightenment. This would be a crime against human nature, whose original destiny lies precisely in such progress. Later generations are thus perfectly entitled to dismiss these agreements as unauthorized and criminal. To test whether any particular measure could be agreed upon as a law for people we need only ask whether the people could well impose such a law upon itself. This may well be possible for a specified short period as a means of introducing a certain order pending, as it were, a better solution. This would also mean that each citizen, particularly the clergyman, would be given free hand as a scholar to commit publicly, i.e. in his own writings, on the inadequacies of current institutions. Meanwhile, the newly established order could continue to exist, 
until public insight into the nature of such matters had progressed and proved itself to the point where, by general consent, a proposal could be submitted to the Crown. This would seek to protect the congregations who had, for instance, agreed to alter their religious establishment in accordance with their own notions of what higher insight is, but it would not try to obstruct those who wanted to let things remain as before. But it is absolutely impermissible to agree, even for a single lifetime, to a permanent religious constitution which no one might publicly question. For this would virtually nullify a, a phase in man's upward progress, thus making it fruitless and even detrimental to subsequent generations. A man may, for his own person, and even then only for a limited period, postpone enlightening himself in matters he ought to know about. But to renounce such enlightenment completely, whether for his own person or even more so for later generations, means violating and trampling underfoot the sacred rights of mankind. But something which a people may not even impose upon itself can still less be imposed upon it by a monarch, for his legislative authority depends precisely upon his uniting the collective will of the people in his own. So long as he sees to it that all true or imagined improvements are compatible with the civil order, he can otherwise leave his subjects to do whatever they feel necessary for their own salvation, which is none of his business. But it is his business to stop anyone forcibly hindering another from working as best they can to defy and promote their salvation, and indeed detracts from his majesty if he interferes in these affairs by subjecting the writings in which his subjects attempt to clarify their religious ideas to governmental supervision. This applies if he does so acting upon his own exalted opinions, in which case he exposes himself to the reproach, Kaiser non est supra grammaticus, but not much more so if he demeans his high authority so far as to support the spiritual despotism of a few tyrants within his state against the rest of his subjects. If it is asked now whether we live at present in an enlightened age, the answer is no, but we do live in an age of enlightenment. As things are at present, we still have a long way to go before men as a whole can be in a position, or can ever be put into a position, of using their own understanding confidently and well in religious matters but without outside guidance. But we do have distinct indications that the way is now being cleared for them to work freely in this direction, and that the obstacles to universal enlightenment, to man's emergence from his self-incurred immaturity, are gradually becoming fewer. In this respect, our age is the age of enlightenment the century of Frederick.